Welcome back, everybody. Um, okay, yeah, no, I've got it on the list of uh, what's your stuff. Yeah, I'll my stuff. Of course, uh, you know, any 10 minute health break <laughs> will turn into a 15 minute health break. So, um, uh, we're delighted to have our, our, uh, our second panel, a panel on identity and difference. I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce the panel very briefly, uh, but let me just say afterwards, again, we're going to uh, follow a similar format, uh, collect a question or two, turn it back to the um, participants and, and carry on that conversation. And I do want to confirm that those of you that are in the uh, perimeter table, um, we do have a mic, and if you have a point, please uh, put up your hand and you'll be attended to. So when we come back to that, please don't be, uh, don't be shy on, on that. Um, I'll introduce to this uh, excellent panel on identity and difference. Um, you're going to hear from uh, Sujit Chowdhury um, from NYU, a fascinating paper on uh, both plurinationalism and religion, a, a, a wonderful exploratory piece, uh, really provocative. Um, Abigail Eisenberg uh, will be speaking about rights in the age of identity politics. Um, Abigail is a uh, former colleague and good friend from University of Victoria. And our discussant um, is uh, our very own Bruce Ryder. And so uh, thank you all for participating in the panel. And are we going to begin with you, Sujit? Yes. Sure. OK. Great. That's great. So uh, so this is a paper. So first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's wonderful to be home. And it's uh, terrific to write a paper about Canada. So because uh, uh, those of you who've read this when it came around at midnight last night, um, <laughs> uh, you know, just as unfortunately, that's the way my life is. Um, things are always late, um, but um, or, or just in time. But th this is a very Canadian paper. It's about uh, it's about Quebec uh, religion, uh, religious accommodation, and and the Supreme Court, and it's something I've been thinking about for a while. And I think that um, I, th I think that the the recent uh, Quebec election and the, the proposals for a charter of secularism and just the latest iteration of of this type of drama uh, that's happening in Quebec that you don't see uh, very much in the rest of Canada, and that's really the motivation for the paper. And so the so the so as you know. Um, the, the, you know, freedom of religion has uh, generated a lot of case law uh, in the last 10 years, a very interesting body of case law. Uh, some of these cases are um, decided on administrative law grounds. Some of these cases are decided on charter grounds. And there's a rich kind of literature around this material that Ben and Bruce and others have contributed to. Um, but the, what, what I want to do is kind of engage with a subset of this case law um, from a, the angle of, kind of Quebec, Canada. And what's interesting for me is that a disproportionate number of the cases come out of Quebec. And so I'm thinking in particular about Amsalem, Lafontaine, Multani, Bruker, and SL. And, and they were, uh, and a number of those, of, of those cases were adjudicated under the Quebec Charter. And what, what's very interesting is that the court divides in different coalitions, but it divides often on national lines. Uh, in these cases uh, where Quebec judges, particularly Francophone judges, uh, take a different view. On, on many of the issues that were presented, uh, and in particular, Justices uh, uh, LaBelle and then, uh, and then to the end, Deschamps uh, articulate a very different uh, stance uh, on how these uh, cases should be uh, adjudicated. And, and this is very unusual in Canada. It's unusual because our court divides uh, uh, frequently, but it does not divide consistently in an area of law uh, on this type of cleavage, on this type of ground. And there's not really any other example in our jurisprudence of the Quebec judges consistently in a line of cases uh, voting differently from their colleagues. And, and so and what's interesting is that it, this occurred on this, this, this drama, um, occur, which I think is coming to an end uh, in the SNL case, occurred at a time of intense political debate on these issues within Quebec. And also what I think is a, 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 a great cleavage between Quebec and the rest of Canada on how we think about questions of, of reasonable uh, accommodation, and and so the and so the and, and the cleavages on the court sometimes reflect this broader cleavage uh, within Canada uh, on this issue, and so uh, and so what I want to do is in this paper is kind of reread these cases uh, through the uh, through a Quebec Canada lens, and and what 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 I what I what I what I want to begin by doing um, is to kind of link these. Uh, cases to an earlier episode uh, that involved the Canada-Quebec uh, nationalism of the Charter, and that's the language litigation, right? So let me just begin by framing it that way. So, the, so as you know, 
uh, the charter was part of Trudeau's nation building project, one of the um, biggest uh, sources of resistance that was in, within Quebec. And the reason why is that there was a fear that, uh, that the charter would stand in the way of, of linguistic nation building. In fact, it was deliberately designed to do so. And so this generated a number of cases uh, in the court. And so the, the big three cases are Ford, on, on Bill 101, uh, but also um, the Quebec Protestant School Board case on the Canada Clause, uh, and Solsky uh, on uh, not the Canada Clause, but the provision in, uh, in Section 23 that grants people who've had some of their language in English in another province the right to continue to have their language in English, their, their, their education in English in, in Quebec. And, and so what's, they're very, uh, what's very interesting about these decisions is how they're structured, right? So, so first of all, they're controversial, right? They're, these are issues are very controversial. They're very divisive in they're very divisive in Quebec, and they're also important to Quebec nationalists, right? There's a lot of attention focused on the court, and so the court behaves consistently across all three decisions in the following way. First of all, it says that these laws are unconstitutional because they contravene the charter, right? So they, and they do that unanimously, okay? Um, but secondly, the court says. Uh, that uh, nonetheless, although the law is unconstitutional, um, it's, it's unconstitutional not because the obje objective is illegitimate, in fact, the objective is fine, it's just the, resp the response is disproportionate, so it fails at minimum impairment. And either it says it's not minimally impairing or it reads it down, like it did in Solsky, to, to keep it on safe constitutional grounds. And then the third, the judgments is, is always in these cases from the court speaking institutionally. As we know, that's done very rarely. Uh, and so it's not as if, and, and there's many other cases where the court's unanimous, but there's, a, there's an author to the opinion. Here, you have the court speaking institutionally, which means it's speaking in its collective voice. And so the, so the question is, why would the court behave in this way? in these very high profile cases from Quebec. And I think this is quite deliberate, right? And, and, and the reason it's, it's the courts engage in a strategy is, is this, that as we know, the court's a regionally representative body, and the Quebec representation of the court is of a very special character, right? If you look at the history of the Supreme Court Act, Quebec's representation is the only representation that was always guaranteed by statute. Uh, since 1949 and the abolition of appeals to the Privy Council, uh, Quebec's representation has been uh, set at three. That, that in 82, in some manner, that was entrenched. And the other uh, dimensions of the court's regional representativeness are a matter of political convention. And, and, so, and so, so there is something special about the Quebec composition of the court, and the idea is that it somehow reflects the plurinational character of Canada. But what's, and that we all, I think everyone understands, but I don't think has, what has been theorized is what impact the presence of Quebec judges on the court is meant to have on the adjudication of cases, okay? Uh, and so, and particularly cases coming out of Quebec, and, what's, and so juxtaposed against their representation, the Quebec judges have no special role institutionally within the court. They get one vote. Um, they don't get any special status, except in Quebec appeals, right, on the civil law, where you often have a five-judge panel, but, but, in, but in most other cases, Quebec judges are just like the others, right? And, and so, uh, and so the, so, the, so, the, so the hypothesis is that on, on, on cases of particular importance to Quebec, in particular the national project, the Quebec judges might play a different role. And, right, and the different role is this. Imagine a counterfactual uh, in uh, Ford or Quebec Protestant School Board or Solsky where the court had divided on national lines. Okay? Uh, and so the Quebec judges said, this is fine. It, 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 maybe it breaches the right, but it's, it's, it's the, the limitation is justifiable. And then the majority uh, strikes it down, and it and, and even goes further uh, than uh, than the majority act. Then the court actually did in those cases and said the objective is illegitimate because it's somehow discriminatory. It seeks to redistribute political power away from um, Eng Anglophones to Francophones, which is what one of these. That's one of the objectives of these policies. And so that if the court had done that, it would have been a catastrophe. Right? It would have been catastrophic for the court. It would have been catastrophic for the charter. Uh, if the Quebec judges had continually dissented uh, in these cases of extreme importance uh, to Quebec, uh, it would have undermined the legitimacy of both the court and the charter. And so there's strong pressure uh, for the court to speak in a voice, in a single voice. And so what you see then, and I set up in the paper different ways we can imagine the way this discussion occurred within the court, but however one looks at this, whether the judges were being strategic or whether they were deliberating on these issues, where the Quebec judges were are, uh, you know, particularly able to alert to their colleagues the importance of these issues in Quebec, they got it together. They got it together and they spoke in a single institutional voice and they always have on these cases, okay? 
So then, I, so I look at that kind of drama, and then I compare it to these cases. And what's striking is that in these cases, there is again, um, issues of religious accommodation are a point of binational cleavage, as language was and continues to be. But the courts in these cases is dividing, right? And so uh, you have, you know, Deschamps and LaBelle in particular, until this spring, um, really striking out uh, from, the, from, the, from their colleagues and articulating a different vision of the relationship between, uh, between uh, re organized religion uh, or institutionalized religion and the state. Uh, and so the, and so the, the, the you know, the, these cases are, are, are litigated against a certain backdrop. And so, you know, outside of Quebec and in the court's generic freedom of religion jurisprudence, there's a lot of kind of evolution of the doctrine until these Quebec cases come up. And so essentially what you see in, the, in a nutshell is that the courts work at, a, you know, begun to work out the idea of what freedom of religion consists of. It consists of freedom to and freedom from religion. And, and there's kind of dimensions to that. Um, it hasn't worked out what constitutes a religion, and but and also very interestingly, um, there's no notion of anti-establishment or non-endorsement that is consistently worked out in Canadian case law. And one of the reasons for that is that there's no clause that is the or provision that's a natural home for that. Those ideas kind of get are raised. Um, they're particularly important to Section One in the Big M case. Um, but um, they, they don't really have a, a firm rooting in Canadian law. And, uh, and, so, and so what the courts have been doing instead is to kind of extending the notion of coercion um, to kind of economic coercion or psychological coercion to cover some of the same space as an anti-establishment or non-endorsement provision would do, but they, you can't do that, right? Um, it doesn't take, take it all the way. In particular, symbolic endorsements or intermingling uh, kind of problems uh, don't really, aren't captured there. So then you have these cases, right? Amsalem, um, LaFontaine, Bruker, um, and um, SL, and Multani, right? So very quickly, what do I want to say about these cases in five minutes, right? Okay. Uh, so in, in Amsalam, uh, what's very interesting about the case uh, is that you have the dissenting judges, so it's LaBelle Deschamps, written by Basterash, uh, who basically, um, although there's a big disagreement with the majority about whether and what the test should be for what constitutes a religious belief and conduct motivated by it, there's also a very interesting methodological dispute between the judges about how to assess the problem of reasonable limitations under the Quebec Charter, right? And the majority basically takes an approach that I think is very much akin to what you'd see under Oaks, right? Which is kind of factual, empirical, uh, tries to es establish the degree of impairment on the different interests at stake. And it actually has a healthy skepticism about the asserted aesthetic interest uh, that was invoked to not build a sukkah. Said that this is almost, a uh, it almost comes close to saying that this is like, they just don't like difference, right? They don't like religious diversity. And so we're not even gonna give that any weight. The, the, the dissent, goes out of its way to say that questions of reasonable accommodation are irrelevant to how we think about limitations under the Quebec Charter. We, they have no role here. And so we have to think about these differently. We have to think in terms of the language of reconciliation of rights and harmonization. And so what does that mean? It's, it's, it's a maddeningly vague judgment, right? There's kind of fragments of ideas, right? But what I kind of reconstruct is this idea that somehow, um, you know, the collective interests of Quebecers, social harmony, a collective social interest, there are these codes, there's this code that comes up in Bas Resch's judgment that refers to a broader set of interests around the character of common spaces that are owned and shared by all that ought to be free from um, issues that are potentially points of division, such as religious identity, right? And this idea, uh, I think, is the idea of the neutral state that, that gets picked up very powerfully by Justice LaBelle in his dissenting regions in La Fontaine. Uh, where he says that, uh, the, you know, he sets out a theory of neutrality um, that in his way, uh, in his uh, case, cashes out in the idea that, the, that, that Section 2A only imposes a right. It's a negative right, not a positive right under the Charter. So there's no duty to assist the congregation that's seeking to have land rezoned for religious purposes in La Fontaine. I think that case is a mistake in the sense that what the congregation wanted was not a positive right but a negative right to be left alone to build a place of worship on a piece of land that it owned. Uh, so there, it's, a, it's a mischaracterization of the claim to call it a, neg uh, to call it a positive right. Really what I think, um, you know, what LaBelle was getting at is this idea that when, the, when, when these accommodations are requested and sought from public authorities, they become entangled 
with, que with questions of faith and, and religious institutions. And, and, and the, it's this idea of disentanglement uh, that I think LaBelle is getting at uh, in his judgment that, that motivates his, his reasons. And then that idea of, of not being disentangled takes us to Bruker, uh, where although the majority uh, has no difficulty recognizing an agreement to enforce a get as having the forms of a contract, uh, and then not contravening public order uh, in any sense and hindering, and hence not making it unenforceable. Um, Justice Deschamps, a very emotional, impassioned uh, dissent, um, uh, invokes the quiet revolution, um, evokes uh, the, the battle for secularism uh, in the province as, as reasons uh, to find the agreement non-justiciable in civil court uh, for two reasons. Uh, one. Uh, that um, it, um, and, and, and again, developing the theory of the neutral state um, developed by Justice LaBelle in, in La Fontaine uh, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one um, is that it, uh, it, 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 the court needs to be above members of faith communities when it adjudicates cases in a religiously diverse society. And so it can't be seen as being partial uh, to any one community. And somehow this would would have that problem. And the second is the problem of uh, legitimizing the social meanings that might be quite negative uh, that are attached to certain religious norms that the court might be called upon to enforce. And here, of course, the, the issue with the get is that children who are born um, to a, a Jewish woman who has not attained a get are considered illegitimate under Jewish law. And so Justice Deschamps' concern was that by, by enforcing a requirement to get a get or an agreement to give one, uh, the court would be indirectly endorsing the idea that children who were born to a mother who hadn't received the get would be illegitimate. And Deschamps Deschamps just couldn't countenance that, not in modern 21st century Quebec, okay? Um, very quickly, uh, Multani and SL. So, so let me just finish the story. So Multani is, he doesn't fit this story, right? Because the court's unanimous. But, <laughs> but there's a very interesting debate or division on the court of whether the case should be resolved in charter or administrative law grounds. And Justice Deschamps says this should be resolved on admin law grounds. And she gives utterly unconvincing reasons as to why that should be the case. But I think the reason why she did that is that she wants to preserve a role for a legislative solution for questions of reasonable accommodation within Quebec. And she didn't want to settle or preclude that by resolving the case on, uh, on constitutional grounds. And in fact, she goes out of her way to say that questions, one reason to prefer to resolve the case on, 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 on admin law grounds is that questions of reasonable accommodation really don't fit properly in the Section 1 analysis because they don't take into account collective interests or the broader public interest. So what's she, what's she thinking of, right? What's she alluding to? The idea that there might be a legislative framework for these claims that she does not want to foreclose uh, through the judgment. And then finally, uh, in SL, Deschamps now writes the majority judgment for the court uh, on the new ethics and religious curriculum that's coming in Quebec post the abolition of religious school boards. And so this curriculum is a, a curriculum that would be familiar to many of us in which children are educated about many religious backgrounds and also receive some schooling in ethics and some Catholic parents <coughs> brought a challenge uh, seeking an exemption saying that this interfered with their ability to raise their children according to their faith. And what's interesting is Justice Deschamps says, no, you know what, I'm gonna modify what the, the theory of the neutral state, right? That it's absolute neutrality is impossible. We have to craft a notion of neutrality that recognizes the multicultural reality of Canada. And in that type of context, we will reject this claim and we will reject indirect, you know, she says implicitly, any future claim brought by secular parents who, re who resent being exposed, having their children exp exposed to religion in school. So that's, the, so that's where the courts landed up, and I'll just end with a coda, which is to say that as we're debating questions of secularism again in Quebec, and the potential tabling of legislation to propose a charter uh, of secularism by the PQ, I wonder now whether the court will hold steadfast in its new um, consensus position. Uh, maybe it's, it's developed this consensus because it knows what's coming. That's it. Thank you, Sujit. Um, Abigail. Great. Thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you to the organizers who, I mean, I know you've been thanked already by the other speakers, but I'm, I'm really impressed by how well these papers speak to each other uh, in ways. A uh, lot of disagreement, and, but a lot of uh, connection between the papers. Uh, let me start by framing this as, you know, welcome to my world. And my world is slightly different from the world of cases. So. Um, uh, I do political theory, and in the last 30 years, um, 
the general kind of politics that, uh, has, that we see in Canada, but also in the United States, and actually in various parts of the world, is we're, it's known as an era of identity politics in which a diverse array of groups have become mobilized and politicized on the basis of features of identity such as gender and race, language, ethnicity, indigeneity, religion, disability, and sexuality. And many of these groups have advanced claims for the protection or accommodation of some aspect of their identity. And in some cases, they have used some aspect of their identity to contest the terms by which they have been incorporated into the state. Now, there's nothing new about these claims if we look at them historically. Uh, these kinds of political struggles have been around for a long, long time. But in the last 30 years, there has been a, a particular intensity to these uh, conflicts uh, that is um, uh, unique to this era. Uh, indigenous peoples throughout the world have mobilized increasingly on the basis of in indigenous identity, whereby, in many cases, they didn't. Uh, uh, let's say 150, 100 years ago before the state, religious minorities have mobilized to contest the terms of their access to the benefits of citizenship, for example, by entering debates about the legal recognition of religious arbitration, prohibitions on wearing headscarves, kirpans, uh, blasphemous cartoons, the criminalization of polygamy, to name a few examples, and other uh, groups as well. Now, if we look at the political theory about this, there's been a lot of scholarship about this, actually not just the political theory. There's been a ton of scholarship about this, and most of us have spent our graduate school years or our, our, our years as professors or our undergraduates reading a lot of the scholarship if you look, took any sociology or uh, political science. And what you generally find is two, very generally, two kinds of literature. On the one hand, normative political theorists such as uh, Charles Taylor, Anthony Appiah, Wilkim Licka, James Tully, have written generally in an optimistic vein about these um, developments, about this kind of politics. What they've done is they've developed a lot of arguments for us as to why identity is a helpful and revealing way to understand injustice. And they've offered in their works a lot of compelling reasons why the recognition of identity is prima facie a means to respecting others by recognizing the depth of their attachment, either to a language, or to culture, or to religion, or to ethnicity, whatever it may be. And they've suggested that identity is sometimes a useful way to track social ex exclusion and historical injustice of particular minorities. That by thinking about identity politics, we can have a good perspective, at least in some cases, on what the ends of justice should be, about how best to protect human rights, how best to protect equality for certain groups. Drawing on their view, a politics sensitive to identity claims can provide a helpful perspective for public decision makers, because it can help reveal, not in all cases, but in some cases, what it means to treat people equally in genuine ways, and that it can place pressure on public institutions, such as courts, to develop institutional reforms that interpret abstract rights from a perspective sensitive to culture, to religion, and other forms of identity. So that's the normative literature. Then there's the more empirical literature, coming from political science, coming from sociology, legal scholarship, not so optimistic at all. In fact, in a lot of the, the more empirical literature that looks at the actual processes of uh, identity constituting how groups constitute identity within groups, uh, how identity becomes mobilized before public institutions, how public institutions respond to that identity, um, the empirical scholarship shows that when the abstract ideals get put into a kind of real world reality when we see it work on the ground, that there are a lot of risks and problems. And generally, that literature can su suggests that there are four kinds of problems that we find um, when abstract ideals about identity protection get placed within the law or within politics. First of all, that group identities get essentialized and stereotyped. Um, number one. Secondly, that um, in making decisions about identity, often our public institutions, often the processes around them, end up entrenching uh, the particular power elite 
or a group hierarchy. So patriarchy gets entrenched in groups by recognizing group identities, uh, which is a common theme, but it's not the only theme. Uh, thirdly, that identity causes uh, social fragmentation, tribalism. Identity politics causes very common uh, criticism. And fourth, that there's a form of co-optation uh, that identity politics uh, ushers in, whereby groups get offered mild, modest forms of cultural protection, symbolic protection, where deeper forms of injustice go unaddressed. So those are the basic four criticisms of identity politics. Now, what my paper does is it looks at the charter and tries to see uh, identity politics in the charter. The paper examines the risks of identity politics in relation to Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And as we know, the charter coincides with what I have basically called the era of identity politics. And so it's very unsurprising to find that in many of its sections, identity is named. Various categories of identity are named categories by which people can receive constitutional protection. You have section 15, which we've heard Roz has talked about section 15. There's section 27. There's linguistic rights. There are all these groups. And all of those sections, and outside the charter, there's indigenous rights. All of those sections have had a fascinating effect on mobilizing groups to advance claims on the basis of identity. So there's lots of identity politics in relation to charter jurisprudence. But what the paper does is that it looks at two particular uh, manifestations of identity. And what I'm especially interested in is the way in which these uh, manifestations uh, uh, reflect the dilemmas that we see in political theory, or that, sorry, that we see in the political theory versus the empirical literature. So one of the dilemmas is uh, found in um, what some people are calling an identity approach, whereby judges are viewing characteristics, uh, religion specifically, religious commitments and practices, as immutable. And uh, one of the people who talks about this uh, talks about it as an identity approach in the charter. This is Richard Moon. And he talks about what he says is that this is a good thing. Because when judges view religious commitments and practices as immutable, uh, they question uh, the way in which the state has sometimes favored Christian religion. And they view that as potentially uh, denying dignity and respect to minority groups. So viewing religion as a immutable characteristic rather than just considering whether people have a choice to practice their religion all of a sudden makes the terrain of what is considered a religious equality look quite different. And Richard Moon says that this immutability um, uh, this I identity approach allows the court to better trace the historical injustice of policies, state policies, that had otherwise been viewed before the charter as not as neutral or as not denying religious freedom. Well, that's fine, and that complies with what some of the normative theorists have been saying about identity politics, that when you look at things in terms of, in this case, immutable characteristics, uh, that that provides an easier way to trace and track historical injustice. The problem, of course, is that the empirical uh, theorists or the empir people who have commented on this aspect and looked at a variety of cases that reflect a kind of, uh, let's say, courts looking at a characteristic as immutable. Their concern is that, that doing that ends up um, uh, entrenching power hierarchies and stereotyping groups. So there's one dilemma. The second dilemma, which I won't say very much about, uh, I'll just tell you what it is, is the dilemma created by reasonable accommodation. On the one hand, reasonable accommodation is thought as a great way of expanding uh, the way in which the public sphere recognizes groups by incorporating minority practices into mainstream life through reasonable accommodation. On the other hand, there's a literature, including literature written by Ben Berger and uh, Day and Brodsky have an article on this, that talk about 
accommodation both in the context of employment law and with respect to religious minorities as a form of co-optation, or what I would call co-optation, as providing modest, uh, modest reforms that in fact only offer groups assimilation into uh, or the chance to participate into the way in which majorities uh, do things. And so it's not real genuine equality, it's a kind of a window dressing. So the conclusion in political theory about the fact that there are all these risks is that we should give up identity politics, that this is a bad way of uh, going about thinking about equality, of thinking about justice and thinking about human rights. They think that the risks far outweigh the benefits. I strongly disagree with that particular conclusion. I think it's both unrealistic and unwarranted. I think it's unrealistic because I don't think that these claims, although more, more intense in the last 30 years, I don't think they're unique to this era. I don't think they're a fad or a fashion. I think that they are not going away. I think many of the groups that have mobilized around identity claims um, have had success. In Canada, I would say groups like groups organized around disability have had interesting success. And in the world, I think some uh, other groups have had uh, interesting successes, and there are, but in many cases, the grievances that have motivated these groups have not been addressed adequately in all cases, and therefore, um, I would think that those claims are not going away, and the groups are not dissolving. So public institutions don't have much of a choice, but in, in that sense, uh, except for addressing these uh, claims fairly. The other reason is that I think that it's unwarranted uh, to think of identity politics uh, or these identity claims as, um, as far too risky. That there is no, in my mind, there is no logic to the claims that is unique to identity. Um, I think that uh, the problems that I've mentioned, uh, social fragmentation, co-optation, entrenching elite hierarchies, essentialism and stereotype, uh, those problems are in all kinds of claims making and in all kinds of politics. And in fact, one of the concerns I have is that um, the people who have uh, commented, or it, when we look at identity politics, we should not look at it as either normative or strategic. That in fact, we should look at it as both that these claims are both normative and strategic, and so what we should be focusing on is how public institutions can be designed, or the, what I'm interested in is how public in institutions can be designed, so that they are more able to maximize the benefits that we see and mitigate the risks. So in the paper, I talk about two possible ways in which, and uh, albeit they're underdeveloped, uh, but I'll, in two minutes I will tell you what they are. One is what I would call institutional humility. And that is, I'm interested in the ways in which we incorporate into our institutions, and you can think of the courts in this respect, the capacity to reflect on the failings of, uh, or the gaps in the way in which their, um, uh, their uh, decision making uh, can be fair to minority groups. So the fact that we have three justices on the Quebec Supreme Court, and Sujit, your paper gives me cause to pause about this, uh, but, but nonetheless, the fact that that has been incorporated in Canada, the fact that there is pressure in Canada to get minorities on the court is just an example, it's just a very small example of the way in which the institutions reflect on their own shortcomings and the way in which there is a drive to reform institutions so that they are better able to reflect on uh, uh, these shortcomings. The second is what I would call democratic space. So Colleen Shepard's going to give us a paper about the, the way in which um, uh, judicial decision making has become much more, I think you call it process oriented, but the way in which, and, and that's a very, an idea very interesting to me, the way in which not only uh, do we see a lot of forums in which groups can participate in uh, the articulation of their identities in relation to the kind of um, uh, laws and protections that they want. So in indigenous um, law, the duty to consult is a good example of that. But it's not the only example. But the way in which the courts uh, 
have also um, attempted to create democratic space by endorsing attempts that have been made within the public forum to um, allow groups to have a say in the way in which uh, their identities are represented in courts and the way in which abstract rights end up um, being interpreted in a way that is respectful of their identity. I know that's very vague, but it's an underdeveloped part of the paper, and my time is up. So uh, we'll leave it at that and um, go on to Bruce's comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Bruce, please. Thanks, Abigail. Thanks uh, so much, Sujit. It's a great, uh, great pleasure to um, start the discussion on, on these two wonderful papers by two scholars who I have so much uh, respect for. Um, let me say a few words about Sujit's paper and then a, a few words about Abigail, and, and then we'll open it up to um, discussion. I was so delighted to have the opportunity to read Sujit's paper exploring the impact that nationality is having on judicial decision making in the context of section. 2A at, uh, at the Supreme Court of Canada. I think it's a, a wonderful theme. As I was saying to Sujit a few, a few minutes ago, it's one of those things that was sort of registered as I've been reading the cases, but haven't really grappled with it and thought it through. And I think there's a very rich um, line of investigation here that Su Sujit has opened up. Um, and much of what he has to say, I found utterly persuasive. But there's some of what he had to say, and, and this is what I want to just pick, pick a bit of a, um, a, fight. Uh, a fight, yeah, yeah. or at least open, uh, open up for discussion. <laughs> yeah. I think he's overreaching. Um, I don't know if it's like you left Canada and now you're more easily enlisted for, by the Parti Québécois, for example, to stir up trouble here. But it feels a little bit like that to me, that um, uh, you're, you're searching for divisions that I think there are definitely um, glimpses of what you're talking about. But I want to argue that despite those glimpses of a different attitude on the part of the Quebec judges on some of the subtleties of the jurisprudence, there's in fact a great deal of pan-Canadian solidarity mm -hmm. around attitudes to um, freedom of religion and, um, and multiculturalism on, among the judiciary. And, um, and so there's a counter-narrative that I think needs to be told to to Sujit. So Sujit was pulling out the strands that supported his argument that there are real differences between the attitudes of the Quebec judges and the, the judges in the rest of Canada. And let me, I want to give a few, uh, a number of examples suggesting that hmm, they've got a lot more in common, really, almost all of the time. And the other thing I want to say before getting to that about, about this issue is, I think we're used to thinking about these issues in the context of federalism and, and, and language debates. And even there, you know, sometimes there's a predictable relationship between attitudes to, say, issues of provincial autonomy based mm -hmm. on the province of a, that the judge has been appointed from. Sometimes not so much. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wary of talking about this as if there is some kind of predictable correspondence. I, at the same time, we know that judges like Justice Betts, for example, great, uh, decentralist and very articulate, and not surprising that he's a Quebec judge who, grew, who came of age as a scholar during the Quiet Revolution. There's definitely something to these arguments. I don't want to deny them, but I think we have to be careful not to say, oh, Quebec judge, therefore. Mm -hmm. And um, there's an interesting interaction here between language and nationality. And uh, again, it's another reason to be wary, because I think language may be, or maybe even religion, uh, of the judges may be just as revealing as which province they were appointed from. And when I think of, say, someone like Justice Laforet, uh, a New Brunswick, he's, for, he's a maritime judge, he's a New Brunswick judge, or Justice Ledain, uh, Ontario judge, but he's really a Montrealer in spirit. And I think you could make the same kind of case for, for Justice Laforet. It's hard to situate him geographically, uh, but ideologically, he was closer, I think, at least when it comes to federalism disputes, to Quebec judges. Mm -hmm. So I think all of that complicates this. And, but I, I don't want to anyway suggest that the questions that Sujit's asking aren't worth exploring. But I think, it's, I think the story is very mixed. And some of the things that um, I would want to explore, uh, picking up on mm -hmm. these questions, apart from just looking at the Supreme Court opinions in this handful of, of um, recent cases, is I think we would want to explore uh, how big a difference there is between Supreme Court rulings and Quebec, mm -hmm. and the rulings of the Quebec courts, mm -hmm. to kind of develop the thesis of whether there really is a difference in, in attitude that we can track to these questions. 
Uh, there may be bigger differences between the Quebec courts and, and the Supreme Court than there is within the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court may have, uh, the judges there, I think, really do tend to kind of moderate each other and, and often produce synthetic rulings like the SL ruling that it's hard to attribute to any particular national ideology. Um, it would also, I think, be very interesting to look not just at the Quebec cases that you focused on for obvious reasons, but do you see evidence of mm -hmm. divisions following national lines or linguistic lines um, when the court is issuing decisions on freedom of religion that are originating in other provinces? Because I think your thesis would suggest maybe the divisions won't be as intense or as passionate, but they should still be visible. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I think the counter narrative that could be told to Sujit's is, well, they're not really so visible. Mm. And so I don't want to get into uh, uh, a lot of kind of picking details, but mm. let me just make a couple of obvious mm -hmm. points. Most mm -hmm. of the cases you're talking about, or a number of them are unanimous. And so there is a lot of room for, for agreement. Uh, in the cases from outside the province, recent cases like the Hatterian case, where the court divides 4-3, probably the most important recent ruling on freedom of religion and reasonable accommodation, mm -hmm. there's no national mm -hmm. split. Mm -hmm. You have McLaughlin taking a narrow approach in the, minor in the majority with Binney, mm -hmm. with Rothstein. Mm -hmm. Are they the rest of Canada that's supposed to be more generous? Well, you don't see it. They do have Deschamps with them, but in dissent, and Abella wrote quite a strong dissent in that case, mm -hmm. you have LaBelle and Fish, two of the Quebec judges. Um, so, uh, and again, I'm not, I'm, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to what you're exploring, but I, I don't think I don't think you want to state any of it too strongly in terms of a general pattern. That's my sense. Um, uh, a, f a few words about um, Abigail's paper. Wow, I would really love this theme too. I do a lot of anti-discrimination law, so for me, the whole question of identity. And, um, and its relationship to charter claiming and, and, and um, the connection between identity claims and the achievement of social justice is very central to a lot of what I think about. So I really enjoyed reading Abigail's paper as well and, and found much of it utterly um, uh, convincing. So I'm not sure I have a whole lot to offer except from um, the perspective of, from a, of a constitutional lawyer. I was, I was, so I'm reflecting on your observations that come to a large extent from the political science literature. And one of the things that many of us have been struck by in recent years in terms of the pattern of decision making under the charter is just how strong the shift has been from section 15, the equality rights section, to other provisions of the charter. And clearly section 15 claims draw on, consolidate identity in a more powerful and um, uh, way than than, than perhaps claims under other provisions of the Charter. And I'm thinking in particular, say, um, when we're dealing with religion, should it be a claim based on freedom of religion? Should it be a claim based on religious discrimination? 2A, 15. Well, we know what happens these days. The court strongly prefers 2A. Mm -hmm. Prefer to talk about it as liberty, not equality. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure there's much difference there in terms of its relationship to identity because the claim's framed by reference to religion in either case. But think perhaps this is more um, opposite. Think of, uh, what about section seven versus section 15? Develop all kinds of recent cases that involve claim of a violation of liberty and security of the person, but also implicate equality concerns. Uh, some obvious examples, the Insight case could easily be talked about as um, uh, the shutting down the, the safe injection site in, 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 in Vancouver had serious implications for people with disabilities. And, f and a population characterized by poverty and disproportionately by uh, aboriginality and, and other prohibited grounds of discrimination. Could easily talk about it that way. Same thing, of course, for the prostitution, uh, the challenge to the prostitution offenses. You could easily talk about it as this is, these are issues of sex equality. These are Section 15 issues. Um, the Amsalom case could have been talked about as a case uh, uh, primarily about discrimination on the basis mm -hmm. of religion as opposed to religious freedom. And I'm sure all members of the audience could add lo lots of ex examples. How do these cases get discussed and decided these days? Typically under Section 7. L we talk about liberty, talk about security of the person, and the equality claim often gets brushed aside. The assisted suicide case is another example, although I guess Lynn's you know, Lynn Smith did just, an, I think, a fabulous job in the trial ruling in that, in that case that dealt equally well with the Section 15 and the Section 7 issue. But that's fairly atypical these days. There's a real preference to rely on 
framing the argument as based on liberty or security of the person. Universal interests, you can frame the argument in a way that doesn't make identity disappear, but it's certainly not as much at the forefront. And I think that's a choice that's made strategically by litigants these days. And I think judges are more comfortable dealing with those universal interests than they are dealing with identity. There's a problem with this for because of the themes that Abigail was talking about and how important identity claims can be to addressing issues of social subordination and structural power relations. Some of that, I think, gets lost in a very important way when we shift the tension from Section 15 to the other provisions of the Charter. And there's a phenomenon going on here, I think, in terms of the subordination of the identity claims that may be partly related to some of the problems that Abigail was talking about, but my sense is it has a lot to do with the judicial reluctance to deal directly with power. And it's easier to talk about liberty and security of the person as universal interests that everyone shares and is entitled to. And I think a very similar pattern in the US jurisprudence these days. In fact, um, uh, Kenji Yoshino wrote an article called The New Equal Protection in the Harvard Law Review last year, a couple years ago, where he basically said this is exactly what's going on in the US jurisprudence. And it's because of pluralism anxiety in the US generally, the judges are not all that comfortable dealing with equality issues, and they're more comfortable dealing with constitutional issues when they're framed as universal interests related to um, the due process clause, liberty, and other um, uh, interests. And um, uh, Richard Ford, uh, in his um, uh, recent book, um, The uh, Rights Gone Wrong, How Law Corrupts the Struggle for Equality, um, makes the argument that equality rights, and this is, you know, this is a progressive scholar, makes the argument that equality rights are an over-prescribed antibiotic that threaten to do more harm than good in the struggle for social justice. I don't think that's the case. I don't think Ab Abigail thinks that's the case either. Um, but I just want to, I know this is a bit sideways from your paper, but it was, those were the thoughts that, that the paper provoked for me, is there's some very interesting dynamics going on in contemporary charter jurisprudence, and I think in other countries as, as well, where the identity politic aspect of the claim gets submerged in favor of articulating the claim more by reference to universal um, uh, interests like liberty. Thank you, Bruce. So I'm, I'm just going to take stock momentarily where we're at. Um, we'll take an extra five minutes into lunch, it just stop at 12.05, so we have a half an hour. Um, I think our goal is to hear as many voices from around the room as we can, so I'll encourage you all to keep your questions as well as your responses as kind of tidy as possible. And I, I'll take a list at, at this stage while we give a chance to Sujit and Abigail to maybe just say a word or two sure. before we turn to the broader uh, questions. So, so let me just pick up on a couple of comments. So I think actually it'd be, it would be terrifically helpful to look at how the Quebec Court of Appeal decided these cases. I do know that in Amsterdam and La Fontaine, the claimants lost, and, the, and so the court reversed. And there was very strong criticism of the Court of Appeal in Amsterdam, actually, by the majority in, in Amsterdam. You know, so, uh, yeah. but in Meltani as well, I, I don't recall what, how the Court of Appeal went on Bruker, but I think it would certainly add an important dimension. In terms of your, your methodological point, we shouldn't be looking at where the judges come from and so on. Look, so here's my take on this, right, which is we're uncomfortable as Canadians at talking about this because that's not how we conceptualize our legal culture, number one. Number two, um, it doesn't happen all that much, right? So we can always, you know, say, well, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't look at these issues because actually it's very hard to predict. I think that's right. And in fact, for me, the big example is, you know, a bunch of federally appointed judges struck down the Securities Act, right, or found it unconstitutional. So if anyone thinks that the judges are federally minded, just read the securities reference, okay? Um, but, they, on, but on the other hand, that's not, that's not to say that in a subset of cases that are about Quebec, it doesn't matter within the court. I refuse to believe that. I, don't, I, think, I think that the judges are acutely aware uh, in cases that involve the national project, and that I would include in that the Quebec secession reference. There is, a, there is this anxiety, there, the, the judges make an effort to speak in unanimous voice. Why would they bother to issue a judgment in the name of the court that is unanimous in these high profile cases? Where they, and they so rarely do so in other cases, right? 
Why would they do this consistently in this line of cases? I think it suggests something about the dynamic on the court uh, among the judges. So that's all I would say. Hooderite brethren, I agree, it's a crappy decision. Uh, but, uh, and it doesn't fit, I, I would only say is that LaBelle moves over to the other side, right? Mm -hmm. So in Bruker, LaBelle's now with the majority, right? And whereas in La Fontaine, he was in the dissent. So something happens mm -hmm. between La Fontaine and Bruker where then Deschamps really left on her mm -hmm. own. And then in SNL, Deschamps now is a new leader in, for a different vision on the court. So, so, so that's the way I would, I would, I would situate that case. So I guess all I would say is that Bruce and I don't disagree at all, um, and that I uh, uh, that uh, it's not um, it's not news to me that the courts don't provide an answer mm -hmm. to the problems, uh, and it's actually not bad news either. Um, so, but I would say that uh, in addition to looking at the way in which the courts, I mean, shift consideration from having to think about identity in relation to the equal, the equality of groups, and I bet you they don't want to do that, to a more liberty-centric approach where they can focus only on individuals, let's say, or primarily on individuals. Uh, then I, I actually, it makes me even more curious about the ways in which the court try to create democratic spaces in which their judgments end up endorsing not the principles that they want to inject into the process about the liberty of the individual or the status of the identity group, but that they want to actually recognize the way in which groups have decided to solve the problem in the context of, let's say, uh, well, the case, the, the examples in Canada, I, I don't have very many of them, but the Begum decision was very interesting in the United Kingdom, uh, where there was an endorsement of uh, the way in which a school had gone about trying to put together um, a consensus attitude about the kind of veil that the students uh, should be allowed to wear. And so, it dis and so the kind of verification and validation of that is what I think, those are, that's what I call creating democratic space. And it's also a great uh, example of a kind of institutional humility that we are not in the best position through the tools that we have to be making this decision, but let's go and recognize how people have forged pragmatic solutions to these problems um, outside of a litigative sphere. So we have a nice and expanding uh, list of, uh, of questions. And so uh, let me just read that out. We'll maybe take uh, three at a time, have a chance and come back. Uh, Robert, uh, Howie, Margot, uh, Ross, Les, Colleen, and Jenny. Okay. So Robert. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben. So Jeet, I, th I really think it's all about the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court because in Amsalem, Baltani, and Bruker, Unanimous Quebec Court of Appeal, all three of them overturned out of Ottawa. And of course, they're all federally appointed judges. So it's not that these are mm. sort of Quebec City appointees at the lower level. Mm. It's federal appointed judges sitting in Montreal. Uh, and they're not coming at this thing the same way the judges are in Ottawa. So that, I think that's the real story. Uh, I think there's a risk in looking at that story. Like the people who tend to tell that story from the common law provinces are very situated as well. And so the sort of assumption is, of course, that the majority in Bruker got it right, or that that's the feminist mm. position, or that that's mm. the, the multicultural position. Mm. And so I think when you tell that story, you know, you might even need to, to contextualize it by stepping outside the judgments and remember the Ontario arbitration debate of 2005, 2006, whenever that was, that I think there's a risk of sort of caricaturing the happy multicultural mm. English provinces mm. and Quebec, mm. uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal and the Chinese head tax case. There's, it's not that sort of multiculturalism is, you know, glory, hallelujah, in all the other places. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but what is interesting, I think, is to try to tease out the, the deeply held and sincerely believed understandings of the appropriate place of religion mm. in the public sphere in Quebec. And Laurie Beeman's done some interesting work on the, the sort of translation of religion into cultures. So the, how do we make sense of the fact that we don't want religion to be visible, but the crucifix has to stay? Uh, and the, whether one agrees with them or not, they, they are sort of complicated, deeply thought out positions mm -hmm. that I think are worth drawing out. And I, so I think it's a Quebec Court of Appeal, Ottawa split that will be richest. Um, but I think it's worth coming at with a great deal of sort of suspended judgment mm -hmm. to try to understand things in their best light. The, it's interesting hearing the, 
the, the dissent in Amsalom described as sort of baffling. I think from the Quebec perspective, where the Quebec Charter is seen as affecting day-to-day -day interactivities, mm. what's baffling is that you would bring Canadian Charter jurisprudence into it. Mm. Uh, why, would, why would you do that? Of course, neighbors living with one another, there's a give and take. Uh, and so it, 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 just giving these judgments sort of on the ground level, their full due, I think, is something that, that requires care. Sebastian Grandmont, you probably know his piece on the way the Quebec courts have interpreted freedom of religion under the two charters. Uh, that might be worth looking at further. Howie, if you could just introduce yourself as well. Uh, hi, uh, Howie Kislow. It's a uh, SJD student at the University of Toronto. Um, I was going to say um, some of the things that were said by uh, Professor Ryder and Professor Lecky here uh, in response to Professor Chowdhury's paper. Um, what I was going to suggest, and it seems to me in your remarks that you've already considered this, was just to also look at the concurrences in the Supreme Court of Canada, that mm. it's, it's a little bit... Um, it's surprising where some of the Quebec judges end up in, in the cases that you've mentioned, um, and that Ontario judges end up siding with uh, the so-called Quebec position written by Justice Deschamps in, in, you know, in, in Brooker especially. Um, but what I, I think what I might have to add is uh, there's a case that's uh, pending at the Quebec Court of Appeal that's been argued but not decided, which I think is a much, di much more interesting challenge to the ethics and religious culture case that was um, decided in SL, but it's a case brought by uh, Loyola, which is a, an English language publicly funded Catholic school, mm. um, as, insisting on its right not to have to teach the ethics and religious culture program as, as mandated by the Quebec government. And I think that complicates the politics uh, of language, region, uh, religion, et cetera, um, and might, uh, you know, we're, we're waiting to see what the Quebec Court of Appeal has to say, but at the Superior Court, uh, the judge, the judge found in favor of of the high school, um, so I think that might be a case worth uh, theorizing about. That's great. And, and Margot, why don't you take my? Oh, actually, I've got one. Okay. Thanks. Well, those are really two really great papers and commentary. Thank you very much, Abigail. My, I have um, just some thoughts about your paper that are really quite unformed. I was hoping by the time my term came on the speaker's list, they'd be more congealed, but they're not. Um, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. Um, so there, I think your paper is fabulous, but it leaves me with a discomfort about the reference to identity politics so uncritically in terms of your frame of talking about these sorts of politics. And, and I guess there's a way in which when I read your paper, I hear echoes of legal feminism around the difference dilemma and the way in which difference is recognized and either tolerated or celebrated or embraced. And I really think that's what the Day and Brodsky, Brodsky piece is very much about, which is how we actually conceptualize difference and, and understand it and respond to it. And the risks that you identify of stereotyping or essentializing and particularly of tinkering rather than doing substantive change to hierarchies are really around how difference is coded and what the response to it and how it's understood to be distributed, not only in relation to the groups who are the claimant groups, but also to the rest of us and to those who stand on the privileged side of, of the metrics. So, I don't, you know, and, and in, there's a way in which I'm much more comfortable talking about difference and about systemic oppression than I am about identity politics, but I'm not quite sure why that is. And I wonder if it's because the sort of framing everything as being about identity politics keeps pushing me back into thinking about it as a kind of individual analysis rather than moving to the systems of power and the piling on of oppressions that actually make up systemic subordination. And so I, I acknowledge these are sort of random thoughts really about how one would frame the issues you're talking about. Um, and I'll leave it at that. And then the last point I wanted to make was in relation to Section 7, because the point that Bruce makes, makes is a really interesting one. It's interesting strategically, but I think it's also interesting conceptually in terms of how the different rights in the Charter are being unpacked. And I think that identity does figure in Section 7, but in an unarticulated way. But I'm wondering if it actually figures through the deep contextuality that we're seeing judges employ in their approach to cases like Insight, the prostitution reference, but also the Adams decision that went up to the BC Court of Appeal, which is about temporary overhead shelter for individuals who are sleeping rough. And so um, I'm intrigued by sort of trying to take your analysis as a critical framework into Section 7, which I think 
is what Bruce points towards, and I think it, it works over there, but in different, less uh, obvious ways. So great paper and comments, thanks. So Sujit, Abigail, you have four or five other people on the list who want to provide helpful comments as well, but I think maybe now is a good pause point where they're still fresh, the first three. Do you want to say a word or two? Sure. So maybe let me just pick up uh, on Robert's point. So yeah, I think you're right. I need to pick, go to the Quebec Court of Appeal versus Supreme Court story. Um, so I guess let me kind of just pick up on a couple of things you said. The first is that I don't dispute that these beliefs are sincerely held. I mean, in fact, I give them their due in the, in the, uh, in the written version of the paper. I, my, what motivates the paper is that these are, these are points of real difference of opinion on the court, and that these track kind of divides that we generally don't see in any areas of charter jurisprudence where the court divides all the time, but not in this way on these issues coming out of this province. And so there is something, and the fact that Justice Deschamps is, talks about the Quiet Revolution twice in her reasons, and I did a text search, the Quiet Revolution is never mentioned except in Solsky in the whole corpus of charter jurisprudence, and yet we all know how profoundly important that, that, that way of organizing um, an under, a conception of the different constituent elements of modern Quebec, be it the role of the state in the economy, language laws, religion in, in, in public institutions, is. And so I, I think it's about conflicting visions over this. I don't dispute that. Um, and I, I also think that although it's, it's certainly not the case that Ontario is a multicultural nirvana, and I don't want you to think that I was suggesting as such, there is a cleavage that I don't think we should shy away from between how these issues are debated and understood in Quebec in the rest of in the rest of Canada. And I think that, and I'll give you th three pieces of evidence. The type of legislation that is tabled in the Quebec National Assembly by all sorts of parties, you just don't see that, okay, um, in, in, in other provinces. The, the fact that these issues become points of cleavage and political debate during not just the most recent Quebec election, but in 2007, where the ADQ opened up the door to all sorts of ugliness in the Saguenay that no one in English Canada talks about. And then, and then finally, public opinion polling data, right, on issues such as the hijab, which shows that although there, is, there are people opposed to those accommodations across Canada, there are differences of opinion between Quebec and the rest of Canada on the degree of accommodation that ought to be provided. So I don't think, so, and, and the point is that this, this cleavage has occurred in Canada and now it's come on to, it came onto the court and now seems to be going away. And that's the, uh, that's the, the motivation for the paper. So, so I, and I, won't, I, I don't think I'll pull away from that. Okay. So Margo, thank you very much for your comment. I mean, I will look in the Section 7 cases, uh, but your first comment is maybe something I could respond to, but I want to make sure that I have understood what you mean. And um, is it the case that uh, the framing things in terms of identity politics, which is not a loved way of framing it, and I use it on purpose, because I think that actually describes the kind of political mobilization I'm interested in. Um, that that brings with it a discourse about difference and stigma that is, that you can't get over in a sense, that all of us have a problem getting over. Is that kind of what you're concerned about? No, no, um, I told you these thoughts were still in the no, process, no. so. Um, but what I meant is uh, when I read your discussion of identity politics, I think of a discussion that takes place amongst legal feminist theorists around the difference dilemma, this idea of whether you perpetuate hierarchy, you actually transform um, through recognition of differences. So it's, it's that different language about talking. And, and I think you're absolutely right that identity politics has a currency and a descriptive value. But there's just sort of by, um, I don't know. I just, I just have some discomfort about that framing of what these kinds, a, a sort of singular framing of what these concerns are about, and wonder if actually sort of bringing in more explicit language about difference as a way to explain some of the risks associated with identity politics less complicatedly understood, that's all. So it's not a critique of your use of the term per se descriptively, but analytically, Perhaps it's a linkage to another conversation that might amplify some of the risks you, you describe. 
Okay, so I guess how I just would respond to that in 30 seconds, and that's not an adequate response, but given the constraints here, is that I think it's really interesting from what I've heard so far today, uh, that, and read in some of the papers, that um, the uh, concerns about religious groups and concerns about poverty and gender, actually, which I've always found the most difficult category to deal with in terms of identity politics. Yes, people organize on the basis of gender. No, there's no sort of collective thing to, not like religion, to protect or to, to um, uh, about people's identity that the, I'll, I won't say anymore because I'm going to say something that I disagree with. But, uh, uh, but uh, that, that there is a tendency, here so far, we're, we're taking all these cases and pushing them together. And I would really pull them apart. And I think that was one of the uh, aspects of the conversation in the last session. So um, I think that what's interesting is that, I, and I do in political science, I think it's fascinating, is you look at all these groups and you say, why are you organizing the way in which you're organizing? And the reason is, is because the paradigm and the framing in terms of identity politics, there's incentives for them to do that. Uh, that they will actually get their claims heard if they package them in that way. But their claims are not those kind of claims. They're not best dealt with in that kind of way. So there's a, and this is happening before they go to courts. Uh, so uh, there are those processes and uh, I feel uncomfortable about some of them as well. And then they get to courts and then people go, well, this isn't working out very well. You go, yeah, that's true. Uh, on so, in some cases, it'll work out. In, for some other groups, it just it won't work out. I agree with that entirely. So we have about 10 minutes uh, left for uh, a few more comments and then uh, reflections. And uh, first, if uh, Ross and then uh, Les, uh, please. So this is just a thought and maybe a question for Suj, which is I wonder whether this is a really nice experiment about representativeness on the bench. Generally, I mean, mm. you allude to that, and obviously this comes up a lot when one talks about gender and other issues. And the thought is maybe there's something about your contrast between the unanimity on issues relating explicitly to Quebec and the kind of total fragmentation on issues that implicitly involve plurinational issues, but uh, where it's much more sort of sub cilantro where, you know, the Quebec judges are, you know, re religiously different from the uh, English speaking judges, not in, you know, totally predictable ways, but there is a religious cleavage there, but it's a cleavage that doesn't track the basis on which they're appointed to the court. And so it's just the, yeah. that the more you make explicit the basis of representation, you're here as the woman judge or you're here as the Quebec judge mm. or the Roman Catholic judge, the more reluctant judges are going to be to give voice to that perspective for fear of being, you know, pigeonholed, stereotype, mm. reduced. But the more that there's some basis of representation that tracks mm. something else, but that's not explicit, the more you might actually see it playing out in some sort of more representative voice mm. type story. So that's just the general thought. And then the question is, does that have a, any empirical plausibility in the story you're telling? Because, mm. you know, I know that there is heterogeneity uh, across the judges, but my sense is there is also some religious tracking mm. that maps onto the plurinational religious divide. Thank you. And of course, there's, uh, Suji, I mentioned this to you before, there's also, of course, Justice Fish to contend with yeah, in this story, which tracks uh, Roz's points a little bit as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Les? Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, Suji, if, I mean, part, part of your, the point of your observations are to actually ask whether there's going to emerge problems or issues around this. And um, the, the last couple of years, you know, I've, I've been, um, working with the Ontario Human Rights Commission mm. on, on uh, developing their policy for balancing mm. competing human rights. And one of the, one of the more interesting aspects of, of that policy that we developed were the consultations um, mm. across the country. Mm. And, um, uh, and it's not particularly well written about, but uh, what was quite striking was that in Quebec, the problem about balancing competing human rights, which in a sense was seen as an issue, um, uh, both through the uh, uh, Human Rights Commissions and elsewhere, there was an articulation of around some kind of various interpretations of Lassiti and 
Watson. Uh, Lassity and yeah. um, uh, yeah. uh, and this idea of a public space, neutral mm -hmm. public space, mm -hmm. and the, the issue was seeing that the point of the policy was to try to understand when, if you want, uh, issues of religious identity could enter into the public space, so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in, a, in an Ontario context, it was very much seen as a balancing perspective, that mm -hmm. the, the space was a space where um, all sorts of, if you want, identities, unfortunately I got called out, Abigail, when you're presenting, um, uh, would be balanced. And the actual policy that the Commission has adopted is, mm -hmm. a, is a policy that doesn't embrace uh, uh, any idea of a neutral public space. But the, the interesting kicker is the SL case. Mm. Because what, what happened about that case is that people in Ontario, particularly religious minority groups who we consulted with extensively in drafting this policy, uh, are actually very, very disturbed about that decision because they actually look at the denial of parental exemption mm. and say, we thought that that was actually exactly the kind of things that were on the table when you develop this policy. This policy that the OHRC takes seriously doesn't close the door on that. Mm. And you look at a, a, the SL decision drafted in a Quebec context driven by a particular vision of what a policy around competing rights looks like, mm. and you get a decision that, in our view, ties the hands of our prospects for getting parental exemptions around something like curriculum. Anyhow, so Thanks. I'm just sort of pointing out that it, it may well be coming very much to a head. Interesting. Thank you, Les. Um, if you don't mind passing the microphone down to Colleen. Yeah, actually, I just have two very, uh, one very quick comment, um, and uh, for Suji, and that is, I think, uh, I think a lot of the comments have emphasized how religion is a complex category, mm. and I think in the Quebec context, bringing in the racialization, the overlap between race and religion, particularly in terms of the treatment of new immigrants mm. and all of the leg issues around the wearing of the burqa, for example, there's a, a something there that you might want to. Bring, uh, take into account as well as the intersection with gender and mm. gender equality issues and the role of the state in mm. advancing a uh, conception of gender equality and Deschamps' ideals mm. around gender equality yeah. as well, yeah, so which comes through in, your, in the Broker in decision. Very much so, yeah. And finally, Jenny? Uh, I'm going to shoehorn my question into my comments later. Okay, that's great. <laughs> um, so with <laughs> the final a minute or two, and then we'll give a, a final word to each. And Suj, I just wanted also to add in there on the point of um, if if you stick with a story about cleavage, right? I just want to um, raise the issue that it the cleavage is difficult, I think, to describe as a cleavage about the production of a concept of a neutral state in Quebec, right? And something else in the rest of Canada, right? And there's an uh, an interesting set, and James Whitman has written a bit about this, that you can think about the many forms of secularisms mm -hmm. and the varieties of different approaches one might take to a neutral state mm. um, that could be expressing themselves differently based on histories broadly writ and different sorts of religious identities. And I, I think the histories that you point to, and so you know, it's one matter to say we want a separation and a neutrality Mm -hmm. And that's going to be expressed in institutional separation, but you can still quite publicly uh, express your religious views in the public sphere, a very more American kind of sense of, mm. of that, a free exercise oriented one. Mm. And maybe that's what's going on in, in, uh, in, in outside of Quebec. And in, in, and in Quebec, arguably, a sense of neutrality as being positioned not on state institutions and religious institutions, but on um, public space. Right, differently, and that institutional uh, ref reflections um, yeah. are less problematic. And there's evidence of that if you're looking for it in Amslam, because the other point in Amslam that's very interesting is the interpretation of religion given by the judgment that you cite as the Quebec judgment really empowers institutional forms of religion at the expense of 
the individual forms of religion. It would favor mm. those kinds of institutionalized, objective definitions of religion. Mm. Okay, so do we get to give a couple of comments, or are we gonna? Yeah, a moment yes. or two, yeah, by all okay. means. I don't have any comments. Okay, all right, so <laughs> let me, so, so, you know, with respect to the issue of representation on the bench, so, you know, it's interesting. So first of all, I don't think that the religion of the judges plays that much of a role in these cases, because I think the Quebec judges are fairly secular. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean. So, but I think I mean there was a previous time. You know, if you go back to the '50s, so more Swi Switzman, You know, when the you know there were that was a moment where again, you, you know, you saw different types of religious div divisions on the court translating into voting patterns in all the Quebec cases coming out of the Duplessis era, right? And so that I mean, that, I think that was very much the case, and it's not been written about. Um, I think on when I, when I think about representation in the court, I guess what I'm trying to th what I do in the paper is set, is begin to outline a theory of how we can imagine deliberation on a multi-member court, where you have judges identified with a particular constituency, and what their role is, right? And given that there's no special voting rules, right? There's no there's no special chambers, there's no special voting rules. So what do they do when they sit on, as a nine? And issue unanimous judgment. What has gone on in in the uh, to, to, and and what I what I argue in the paper is that there's a sense in which the Quebec judges are alert to a certain social and political history uh, about the nature of the development of modern Quebec and the importance of certain issues, particular language. I would argue that then I think convinced, persuaded their colleagues that to rule per se inadmissible these policies because they're illegitimate was just not on, right? That would actually just be a delegitimation of the basis of modern Quebec and a, and a broad consensus about the, the appropriateness of certain policies. And so, the, and so their, their, the, and their, their ability as exemplars of the pro, their products of that society, right? Um, the, their ability to, the fact that they've lived through that transformation and are products of it, I think is the, equips them to explain or sensitize their colleagues to exactly the importance of these issues. And so it's kind of an Ann Phillips kind of politics of presence sort of idea uh, applied, taken over from legislatures, but applied to multi-member courts uh, in these types of cases, right? So that's how I would think about that there. And, and so, uh, and what's interesting is that that didn't work in the religion case, in these cases, right? Because if you read, particularly, you know, Justice Deschamps' judgment in Bruker, which we've talked about a lot here, but also I think LaBelle's judgment in La Fontaine is, speaks in the same register. It, it's, it's rooted in a certain kind of lived experience about seeing incredible transformation in Quebec uh, through the 60s and the 70s and 80s. It's spoken from a first person's perspective. And, and the fact that they weren't able to persuade their colleagues of the legal implications of that, that, that view is actually very interesting. Um, it makes me wonder what happened on the court, and it's also then, but it, it's a way in which the, I think it's why in SNL they kind of tried to get it together, because I think they realized that they had to start speaking institutionally in the same voice because there are more issues coming up, and I think Howie and others have suggested there's other cases uh, coming up. Um, I think I'll stop there, because okay. you know, there's a lot more we could say. Well, we've but, talked about constraints, yeah. of course. The constraints on on, uh, on the conversation, there are none. You'll carry them on into into your lunch. I just want to say a word or two. We'll reconvene at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, lunch, sorry, 1 p.m. Yeah, and lunch is just outside in the kind of atrium. Please take the chance uh, to look around, explore uh, the new building. Um, this is a building just a year old or inhabited only a year now, and uh, there's uh, um, there's some lovely spots. And so enjoy yourselves. Uh, put the tablecloths we have to good use. Feel free to sit down and, and eat in here. Perhaps we'll just end uh, by uh, taking a moment, if you'll join with me in thanking Rosalind, Mark, Robert, Suji, Abigail, and Bruce for uh, their comments, for their presentations in the first half of the day. And we'll see you at 1 p.m.